for this morning's message for Mother's Day. Uh, I know many times Proverbs 31, verse 10 through 31 has been, has been preached. But I found it interesting when we were going through Timothy in uh, the end of 1 Timothy 5, 9, and going on in verse 10, that there were seven qualities given for a, a widow for them to be honored. And it struck me how much it corresponded with Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. Uh, it, uh, it shouldn't surprise me how much their coordination between scriptures there is that since it's all one author God using many men throughout the biblical history and yet there was a, a striking coordination between what what Paul was given Timothy as those seven high qualities of a woman that deserved honor Motherhood deserves honor. It is precious in God's sight. It is a gift of God and it is a precious thing that should be should be honored. Actually in Proverbs 31, they those verses, those 21 verses actually correspond to the 21 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and it, as is is the case in a number of places in the Old Testament they the he, Hebrew uh, acrostics or poetry uh, doesn't always come through in in English but here in Proverbs 31 10 through 31 that the original Hebrew was actually in an acrostic that goes from the first letter alpha in the Hebrew alphabet to the very last in those verses. But really what it describes is the kind of woman or kind of mother that is a gift of God. And these are attributes to praise. Now, <clears throat> again, I don't believe that the intent of the Old Testament in this section or even anywhere in the New Testament is to try to put demands upon mothers that they have to somehow be perfect and to complete every one of these seven attributes. I think in more than not, yes, these are seven high standards that God looks at or directives or goals that God has for women and for mothers, yet they are also seven ways in which is brought to our attention that we might honor women and we might honor mothers. Not for women to be downcast because they don't get seven stars, but that that if they have any stars, we should be giving them praise for that. If they have two stars, three stars, even more. But, but any star, any of these qualities are ways in which we should give honor to, to women and to mothers. First of all, we see in this, we see very beginning in Proverbs 31.10, we see an excellent wife and mother. It says here, an excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels or rubies. From the time of creation, God created both man and woman, whatever the world may think. This is God, and this is to bring God glory. But in that context, Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper for him. 
You see, yes, a single woman or a single man can is completed by Christ. But the very nature in which God created man and woman is that they are not meant to be alone. He is made a partner for each. And specifically, man himself is not complete without Christ, but he is also, it is a sad thing to be alone in this world. And for, for us men that God has given a wife, we need to be praising God for her and for that. The first of these seven characteristics, both Proverbs and First Timothy point out is is that there's a faithful wife in that if you fill in blanks there it's devoted to what to her husband <laughs> that that is a <laughs> that is maybe a rare thing I know our own son was engaged to a girl we were somewhat concerned because she confessed to be a Christian, but we were not assured of it. But we didn't want to break ties. We just kept in prayer. And um, that fiancé's mother convinced that her daughter should not marry our son Aaron because Aaron's idea was that that she was to be devoted to him and his his mother's her mother said you need to be devoted to your own career that's number one because men will fail you so you have to be independent and yourself and she took off just days before the wedding by god's grace and then the lord provided him with a wife later that loves him and cherishes him and is devoted both to him and the family. Devoted to her husband. It, if a woman is to become a wife, that is what she is devoted to. That's what she, is the fulfillment of God's plan. But of course, she can only be devoted, fully devoted to her husband. And if the Lord is the one she is devoted to first. The result of that, Proverbs 31, 11 says, the heart of her husband trusts in her. You see, one that has their trust fully in the Lord is one that a husband can fully trust. Because you see, in all of these attributes, Christ has to be central. Or any of these attributes will fall short. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. And it doesn't mean necessarily gain in terms of wealth or possessions. But gain in life. You, you young people, you may think of all the different things which, which are delights. A home of your own and a nice car and, and, and a complete family and, and all of that. But nothing compares to having a life partner that follows you through life that you can fully trust. That is gain. That is gain. No bank account can compare. No success in this life can compare. <clears throat> Proverbs 31, 12 goes on and says, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's a quality. And again, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect in our emotions and our intent and every word that comes out. 
But when you love someone, you seek his or her best interest. She seeks that which is best for her husband and family. Even for the advancement of their respect and reputation, even more than her own. Because nothing is gained by tearing down one another. And as you notice, as we go through this, I'm, I'm giving verses from 1 Timothy in correspondence, not only out of, out of chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, but here throughout the book. We look earlier in 1 Timothy 3.11, and it says, Their wives likewise must be dignified, that is, of elders. They must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. I love that word, but it also convicts, faithful. Many times we think of faithful and we have certain connotations or thoughts about faithful or faithfulness, but the makeup of this word is full of faith. That's what makes someone a faithful person, is that they're full of faith. Grounded faith. Not just pal Pollyanna thinking that, well, everything's going to work out okay because, you know, you're an optimist. Which is not all bad, but is not solid. What is solid faith is that faith which is in Christ, which is based upon his promises, the promises that we are to pass on, both men and women, the promises of God, because God is faithful. We need to be full of God's faithfulness and his promises, then we are full of faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It is to be a lifetime venture to be full. I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, I leak. And I end up getting full of things that aren't full of faith. There are, there are doubts and suspicions and questions and depression and all kinds of things that attack the fullness of faith. Because I start putting my faith in myself or I start putting my faith in the world or I even if I put my faith in other people. It doesn't mean we should just go around doubting everybody. But what we should be doing is trusting the one who is the source of all faith. Be full of faith. Is a faithful wife. Second attribute of these seven is Bring up children. In this, it's devoted to what? To her household. An attribute of devotion. See, all of these really depend upon devotion. It doesn't mean perfection. It's what you're devoted to. Devoted to your marriage and your husband. Devoted to your household itself. Proverbs 31, 13 through 15 says she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. <clears throat> it has that which brings fulfillment. Now, we all know work is involves sweat and pain and troubles. But you do it because of the outcome. What did Christ do for us? For the pain set before him, he endured the cross. What? No, for the hope 
set before him, he endured the cross for us. It wasn't his delight to go through that total misery that no other human being, human body had ever suffered to the extent because he suffered for every one of our sins, not just the physical pain, but for the hope set before him. His delight was to do that for you and for me. And yes, their works have their pains and trouble. Well, we do it for the hope of the outcome. May not like cleaning up after the kids and doing laundry or trying to decide what to have for meals, but it's the outcome. It's the purpose. It's the goal. She is like a merchant ship, verse 14 goes on. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food for her household. That doesn't mean, ladies, that it isn't okay to say, let's have a pizza or let's go out once in a while. We all deserve some rest but and help. But the overall goal is to provide food for the family and portions for her maidens. Verse 21 and after 31 goes on and says, She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She's taking care of her family. You know, in this world of careers, A household mother is not esteemed as it should be because children and families and life itself isn't esteemed as it should be. But those who are devoted to her household is worthy of praise and honor. She manages her household well and finds joy in her labors, keeping the pantries well stocked with foods that are delicious and nutritious and clothes their family well. Proverbs 31, 27 through 29 kind of goes along with this household care. Proverbs 31, 27 says, she looks well to the ways of her household. Not just the food and clothing, but the way in which her household is kept. Now that may mean, yeah, cleaning and orderliness, but even more so in terms of children is their ways. Tentative to what is best for them. Yes, keep them from running out in the street. But more important, the way of the Lord. Bringing up them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, the Lord's way, honoring the Lord, directing their hearts, shepherding their hearts to the Lord. She looks well to the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Doesn't, you know, in the past it was, you know, the old joke about the housewives being stuck on soap operas and now it's stuck on the internet or whatever. It doesn't mean you don't check on things, but don't get sucked into those. Her children rise up and bless her. Now moms, we that are older, you know you go through those junior high and high school years. There's gonna be times, it's not blessings you get from them. <laughs> But oftentimes, it comes back later. What comes around goes around, and they sometimes come to the realization that you were looking after their best interests, the best that we can. You see, it's a heart affair. It has to do with our love. That's why we shepherd their hearts. No matter what happens, we love them because Christ first loved us. Her 
children rise up and bless her, her husbands also. Well, that's an, something that we men need to remember to do. I need, remember, need to remember to do. He praises her saying, my daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Praise from children. Praise from husbands. You see, it's a high calling. Motherhood is a high calling. Mothering is even a model Paul used for ministry. Right mothering and nurturing is what ministries should be about. Every pastor and every minister should follow these kinds of exhortations or qualities in which to be a good pastor. First Timothy 2 7 says, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. You see, they are under shepherds of the great and good shepherd. Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2.15, he says, But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity and self-restraint. Now, some translations will be, will be saved through the bearing <coughs> of children. It's actually the same word. But that word, sozo, in the Greek, can be have multiple meanings. It can be saved or it can be get well from your health or be well blessed. Here in the context here of, of 1 Timothy 2.15, the text is to preserve the honor and reputation of that woman. They'll be preserved. Their, their honor and reputation will be preserved through bearing children if they continue in faith, love, sanctity with self-restraint. You see, it is through, this is a noble cause. Motherhood is a noble cause. The cause of raising children much like in ministry, raising up a congregation who are faithfully serving and delighting the Lord. Uh, it's not referring to spiritual salvation here. Um, Paul did not teach that as the gospel. The gospel itself is is taught that is we are salvation is through faith alone and Christ's work and not our own. It's not by the work of mothers that one is saved, but but the noble calling of motherhood is saved or preserved through those who raise children in faith, who raise children in love, and raise children in the sanctity of themselves and sanctifying their household. The third of these attributes engages in good works. It's devoted in what is to what is good, devoted to what is good. Not necessarily just physical works, but devotion to that which is good. Proverbs 31, 16 through 19 says, she considers a field and buys it. And from her earnings, she plants a vineyard and she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. And she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. 
Well, these are images. No, not too many of you spin your own wool anymore. And you may not be planting a vineyard. But you see, they're all things that are to be productive. Devoted to productive good things. Just not wasteful. Just not wasteful of what they set their minds and attention to. Here it says she delights in the works of her hands. And here in being, being fruitful in what you do, you see she assesses the value and benefit of her enterprises. Assesses the value of what she's sending time on. It may be that they assess that it's better to take time to teach your children right and wrong in a proper attitude than it is necessarily to get the house vacuumed right now because there's a teachable moment. Or it, it may be that there is a certain priority here, a value that they're going to spend their time on that is going to be beneficial for their family and for others because overall motherhood <laughs> is servanthood. It's that which will benefit their household and, and even in terms of, of not extending both her time and energy but also even the money of the household on that which is not fruitful for their family and for their uh, their own interests. Because what is really of the highest good? Proverbs 31, 31 says, give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. It's, it's investing in those long lasting fruits, not just the things that will be good for today and gone tomorrow. Timothy gave some warnings in this. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.9, we looked at earlier as we went through that letter. 1 Timothy 2.9 says, Likewise, I want women to adore themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. And even here is not saying you can't braid your hair, but one of the traditions back then was to put valuable jewels and gold in along with it you know in other words not going to get extreme on spending your money on jewelry but you can buy you know glass diamonds and whatever and still gives the same effect and then if your kids break it or you lose it you're not out of fortune right but he goes on to say what really is the proper clothing but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. You see, that's what is the proper clothing. It's not just necessarily having that which is a fashion now or the, that which glitters, but that which makes a claim to godliness. You know, some biblical examples of that is Tabitha in the Bible. Hopefully, you know people in your own lives that show that priority. Other attributes. Help for the needy. Devoted to what? To the needs of others. Much like the Good Samaritan was. What an example to someone in need. Run across in life someone in need and that, so you make a meal for them. You send them a card. 
You go and visit them. You pray for them. You see what if there was a way in which through your own resources or through some other resources, they can be helped. Emotionally, financially, spiritually, most of all. Proverbs 31.20 says, She extends her hand to the poor. Poor financially, poor spiritually, whatever. And she stretches out her hands to the needy. Here, you see, it, it's displayed in extending or stretching out. It's an extra effort. Going an extra mile for those who are poor or those who are in need. A simple example here out of 1 Timothy, actually in chapter 5, verse uh, 16. 1 Timothy 5, 16 says, If any woman who is a believer has dependent widow, widows, she must assist them. And the church must not be burdened so that they may assist those who are widows indeed. What it's saying is, well, if you know someone in need, here in chapter 5 talking about widows, if you see a widow in need, well, if you're able to, go and extend and help them. Women helping women. That's appropriate. Next is a good reputation. What devotion does this take? Devotion to excellence. Being devoted to excellence. Now, this doesn't mean that you are nitpicking, but you want to be in a good example, an excellent example. Proverbs 31, 22 through 25 says she, she makes covering for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belt to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. Now, we'll look at the fear of the Lord later, but you see, she's, she's full of faith, and so she is, smiles at the future, whatever it may hold, because the Lord holds her hand. It is with dignity, and even her husband is known in the gates. Again, here from 1 Timothy, we don't see so much of a good reputation directly talked about here as the husband, but it does tie there with a with a leader or an elder. First Timothy 3, 7 says, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You see in marriage, a husband and wife are one. And not only does the the wife suffer if her husband has a bad reputation, but the husband suffers if the wife does. And yet, on the opposite side, a good wife is a crown to a husband. You see, the wives often talk. <laughs> and there are those that even sadly get into Bible studies and they rant and rave about their husband's poor qualities, how they're aggravated with them, how they're, you know, and they kind of cover that up with, well, it's a prayer time. This is my prayer request. Men can do the same, you know, hold my old ball and chain. We need to guard one another, both husbands for wives and wives for husbands. And we, you that are married, you know, 
We know things about each other that it's not right to make public or it's not right to sit on that fact. It's not right to hang on to that bitterness or to that resentment or that hurt. We hurt each other. We disappoint each other. But we should <coughs> be lifting up one another. Defending one another. Guarding one another. Honoring one another. Next on our attributes is shows hospitality. Here, what is the devotion then? It's a devo devoted to kindness. Devoted to kindness. Proverbs 31, 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Unfortunately, with all of us, sometimes kindness isn't the first thing that comes out of our mouths, especially when we hurt or we're pressured or we're disappointed. The phrase teaching of kindness in the Hebrew literally is the Torah of kindness. It's the law of kindness. You know, for believers and for right Israelites, kindness is a law. We are to be kind to one another. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for them tithing on the mint and dill and all that, and yet ignoring mercy. They should have done that as well as showing mercy. The kindness. It, it means both she and all of us are under the law, which only can be fulfilled because Christ has been merciful to us, a sinner. He fulfilled the law for us. <clears throat> but because of that, we should fulfill this law of kindness and display God's law of grace to others. Whenever any one of us, and especially here with moms, as moms, shows kindness, that is praiseworthy. That honors that they should be honored for that because it honors the Lord. You see, all of these things that for, for a mom that should be honored is ultimately it honors the Lord by doing these things. We are to honor mothers because of the, the, any of these qualities that they honor the Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 2 earlier said, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, and hospitable, able to teach. And a husband and a wife, they're a team effort. But we see this even within the church. The church is a team. We're to show kindness. But here for a husband or a, or a wife to show kindness, that is hospitable, being hospitable. Um, you know, one of the attributes of, of, of love is kindness. It's holding fast. And it some some of this aspect of kindness is showing mercy is holding back harm. And the last of these seven, the seventh here is washes the saints' feet. 
Well, again, this is a picture that doesn't necessarily mean we have to go wash each other's feet. But you moms sure know you, you sure have to wash your kids' feet, don't you? And, and you never know, even in a husband and wife, we may get to the point where we have to take care of one another in ways that we never thought we would have to. But I think what we see here mostly in washing the saints' feet is devoted to what? First of all, serving the Lord. Proverbs 31, 30 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. You remember the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her own tears and wiped him with her own hair. And later on, Christ himself washed the disciples' feet as an example for them. You see, really what it exemplifies is that there was no one there that thought that they were to be a lowly servant. But Christ himself did not come to be served, but to serve others. And it's what we are called. We serve each other, not based on whether each other deserve it. but in service of the Lord. First Timothy in chapter five earlier, verse five, he talks about uh, widows who were left alone, but he closes that verse, he says, those that have fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. You see, one can be a servant if you, what you've really fixed your hope on is on God. And one of these outreaches is entreaties and prayers night and day. You know, women served in the temple in the Old Testament. Women served the disciples in Christ in the New Testament. And in terms of their standing before God, there is neither male or female. Not in terms of their value. Their role, yes, they'll have different roles. But they have, none of them have a lower standard before God than another. And in the temple, they were in the choir. <clears throat> Women sang in the choir. They helped bring praise and worship to the Lord. They maybe didn't lead it, but they were part of it. They were an essential part. Nehemiah 7.67 talks about that they were, their role, remember all the, the holy ladies that came in to pray and worship? We need you ladies for prayer and worship. God has called you to that role. Yes, men too. But women no less by any means. That is serving the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is an important attribute throughout the scriptures. And, and it means really reverence. The fear of the Lord is reverence. And the fear of the Lord does not drive one away from God. What it does is drives you to him. Lord, have mercy. Lord, give me strength. Lord, I need wisdom. I need the Lord. That is true fear of the Lord. And what does that bring? When we come to the Lord, will he, you ask for a fish, will he give you a stone? 
No, it brings blessing. A woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. She shall be blessed. This is a promise of God. And those, those mothers who fear the Lord, they deserve our honor. Let's pray.